I'm going to give you some thoughts based off of some of the things I'm seeing. And of course, the whole premise of this particular uh, presentation is that um, we are kind of short on hay this year. We've had uh, low production and a few years of what I will call uh, situations that's caused us to use a lot of hay. So um, today I'm really going to talk about, well, how do we stretch the hay that we do have um, and maybe help you think about some things and options that maybe you haven't uh, thought about doing in the past. Okay, so the first thing that I want to kind of uh, bring up is the idea of waste, because uh, our feeding method can have a huge impact on uh, the amount of waste we have. And so uh, in the initial question I asked you guys, you know, I asked you how you're planning on feeding. And looking through uh, the literature, we can find that um, actually feeding on the ground with a hay processor um, can have quite high waste. Uh, 18 to 20 percent is the typical numbers we see. And in side by side comparisons, it looks like that's pretty similar to what we see for rolling out hay. And when I say rolling out hay, I do mean rolling out a day's worth of hay. Um, at, at one time, not uh, multiple days at once. That increases uh, the waste, as I'm sure you all have seen, you know, the cows like to bed down in that hay. It's it's a, a bed and breakfast, so to speak. Um, so that does increase waste. This is just one day's worth of hay. Open ring feeders are also similar in terms of waste, as well as trailers. One interesting thing that um, I came across was that even like those trailers or even those cradle feeders where they have to have their head a little bit higher, it causes them to want to pull out more um, often during the feeding bouts. So they actually tend to waste more because they actually end up pulling it out as they're wanting to have their head back down in a lower position. Um, so that's probably one of the downfalls to some of those feeders where they have to have their head uh, raised more. So the bottom line is that in comparison, if we use even just a sheeted bottom ring, so that's kind of what I have in this picture um, of this, just this yellow ring feeder. It just has the bottom that is uh, no longer open. It's actually closed. Um, that cuts down the waste, uh, you know, by uh, 25 to 50%. So um, just looking at design of ring feed or of your round bell feeders can have a huge impact on waste. And then we can cut it down even more going to um, a tapered cone or a basket feeder. So, you know, you've seen those that have the chains that hang down, or this is actually a cone insert that fits into um, a ring feeder. Um, those also cut down waste quite, quite considerably. So, if you if you are short on hay this year, this may be the time, especially with current hay prices, um, to really take a look at your feeding methods and maybe think about um, possibly investing in uh, some new round bell feeders that uh, may actually reduce some of your waste. Um, some of the costs I've been seeing, they may pay for themselves, especially something like an insert where it's not buying a whole new feeder. And then the last one, which some of you mentioned, um, you know, a processor or a hay buster, if you're feeding it in a bunk, um, then that's actually a quite efficient method um, for actually feeding. You still lose some, and I should point out that this two to five is actually of um, what is being uh, processed. So uh, some of that waste is uh, just what you lose in dust, if that makes sense. Okay, so waste is probably one of the things that people don't think about as much as we probably should. And so I really wanted to, to get you guys thinking about, I mean, we if we can reduce it uh, by 50%, um, that can have you know, a substantial impact on, on the amount of hay we use. Okay, the next thing is about how do we stretch the hay that we have in other ways? And the first thing that I, I really need to, to point out is that we really need to test the hay because we need to figure out if it's going to meet cow needs. And in particular, this year with um, the, the drought situation, that often coincides with actually some higher quality hay. Um, so 
in fact, we might find that they actually don't need to be eating uh, free choice uh, because the hay quality is so good. And so we might be able to do some things to limit intake and actually stretch our hay further. But the only way we're going to know that is if we actually test it. And I do want to point out that last year's hay tells you nothing about this year's hay. And even like uh, I see, even within the same year, you know, two fields that are adjacent to each other um, often can have different nutrient analysis. So I'll talk a little bit more about how to take a good hay test um, here at the end, but I really wanted to bring home an example. So talking about smooth brome, I see variation in hay quality anywhere from about 48 to 58 TDN and six to 11 crude protein. And then on alfalfa, we can go, somebody will be like, I have alfalfa. Well, what's the quality? I mean, it can be as low as 45, which is actually somewhere around uh, corn residue bales, or it can be high as 60 uh, TDN. So huge differences in the feeding value. And typical numbers that I see is 11 to 18% crude protein. This year, I might expect some a bit higher numbers on the crude protein, uh, but those are kind of typical values that I might see. So if we look at um, hay quality, it not only affects the, the nutrient content, but also how much a cow is going to eat if you give it to her free choice. So I just have an example on here, um, low quality, medium quality, and high quality hay. And the way I've defined quality is, is essentially the TDN value, or that's the energy estimate that we have that you would get on it back on a hay analysis. So anything that's less than 52% TDN, we'd expect them only to eat about 1.8% of um, body weight on a dry matter basis. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. Uh, medium quality hay, 52 to, you know, 59%, and maybe about 2.2% of body weight for a dry cow. And uh, for high quality, you know, something that's greater than that 59% uh, percent TDN, she might even be able to eat up to two and a half percent of body weight. Now, again, this is what she's eating. This does not include waste. And this is on a dry matter basis. So most hay is, you know, somewhere around 82 to 85% dry matter. So these numbers um, are just on the dry matter basis. So you'd have to inflate them to get to as fed values. And I'll show you again, kind of give you some ideas, but on a dry matter basis, that means that the difference between a low quality and a hot and a medium quality hay is a difference in expected intake. If you give that cow the option to eat all she wants of uh, about five pounds of dry matter. So on an as-fed basis, that's somewhere close to uh, about seven pounds, if that makes sense. So we're looking at uh, a huge difference in the just the expected amount that she's going to eat based off of the quality. So that's important to understand to know whether or not we're going to meet her needs. Um, but it's also important to know in terms of how much you can expect uh, in terms of disappearance. So now let's look at um, what this cow actually needs. Uh, so what I have here is just, I assumed a 1300 pound cow. I know some people tell me they have smaller cows, but <laughs> the average cow I see anymore is 1300 pounds. Um, if you don't know what your cows weigh, a good way to uh, estimate it is to look at your cull cow weights. And if she was in a body condition score five and she was a mature cow when she went to slaughter, that's a pretty good, or went to the cell barn, that's a pretty good estimate of your mature cow weights. Um, so oftentimes um, they're a lot higher than people think. Okay, so mature cow, 1,300 pounds, what does she need? In mid-gestation, mid so mid-pregnancy, uh, probably where most of our spring calving cows are right now, she's going to need about 11 and a half pounds of TDN and about 1.6 pounds of crude protein. And in late gestation, which that's basically three months uh, prior to calving up to calving, she's going to need about 14.1 pounds of TDN and about two pounds of crude protein or about 2.2 pounds of crude protein. Um, so keep those in your mind. We'll come back to them. So I just took that brome grass hay and I said that low quality brome grass 
Um, so the lower end of what I saw and then the higher end of what I typically see. And I just placed them on here, took those expected body weight intakes, so the 1.8 or the 2.2, and then said, well, how much would she be able to eat? So if I look at low quality, um, she's going to be able to eat about 23 pounds of dry matter. And that's going to equate to about 11.2 pounds of TDN. If you can remember back, which you may not be able to, but if you can remember back to the TDN um, that she requires uh, in mid gestation, that was pretty close. It was uh, about 11.5 here. So even low quality in mid gestation, we're pretty close to meeting her needs. And 1.4 pounds of crude protein, that's a little bit short. It's uh, 1.6 is her requirement. And I will tell you one of the key things, especially with anything that's a low crude protein, lower 7% crude protein or lower, is that typically that means crude protein is actually going to limit her intake a little bit more than the predicted uh, because you're actually going to slow down digestion. So if we give her just a little bit of protein, um, we'll get her intake up to this level and we'd actually meet her needs. So, all right. If you have low quality, feed it free choice, life is good. What about high quality? I mean, now we're looking at she's going to eat about five pounds more. Um, we're going to more than meet her needs in mid gestation um, in both protein and energy. So we're actually, we're going to put on some weight, which might be okay. You might need to be putting on some weight or you might be feeding more than you need to be. And actually we could back off. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you do that, right? So we could reduce her hay intake by about um, four to five pounds here, and we'd probably be uh, in good shape in mid gestation. Uh, if we think about in that late gestation, if you remember back, we were looking at 2.2 pounds of crude protein and about 14 uh, pounds of TDN. So again, it, with this high quality, we're even overfeeding that late gestation cow. Um, so we could probably back off a little bit. So in mid gestation, if I wanted to get these intakes down to say I have high quality hay and I want to get it down, what are my options? Well, one is everybody, a lot of people said they had the hay processor, right? Well, I could just back off on how much I feed. So I could feed um, to where I'm shooting for, you know, that uh, 23 pounds of dry matter plus my 20% waste. So if you were to say 23 pounds of dry matter, um, so say 23 pounds of dry matter plus the uh, 0.2 on waste, so the 20% waste, that would be 27 pounds that I'd have to feed. Plus I need it to be on an as-fed basis. So I'm going to multiply that up again uh, to say that it needs to be divided by 0.85. I'll say my hay was 85% dry matter. So now I need to be feeding about 32 pounds with my hay processor per day to be getting that cow eating 23 pounds of dry matter. I know I'm doing a lot of math here um, and kind of running through it fast, but the idea is that if we know the nutrient content, we can actually start honing in on how much we're feeding. Now, we talked about using a hay processor as an option. Unrolling hay is another option. But what if you don't have either of those options? Well, another option would be to actually just limit the amount of time that the cows have access to a round bell feeder. And I'll tell you, um, we've had some small herds over time where we have done this. And especially if you have just a little bit of supplement that you want to feed as bait, this works really, really well because you can have a place where they have the round bell feeders in part of your wintering lot, and you can just have a hot wire, and on the other side, have a, the area that you're going to feed a little bit of supplement and bunk. So when you want to get them out of the area with the hay, you feed your supplement, you close your hot wire, and um, it actually works fairly well, which I've been very surprised by, because as long as that wire is hot, they will stay out of it um, fairly easily, um, especially, of course, if your cows are trained to hot wire. Uh, that's kind of an important part. Um, but 
in this case, I did want to show you, this was a study where they did grass hay. It's not super high quality. It's probably what I would consider a medium quality. It was about 9% crude protein, 52% TDN. And they basically either gave them full access. And so you can see here 27 pounds of intake of dry matter, which is fairly close to what we were predicting before. Um, if they limited it to where basically they only had access for 14 hours. So in the morning, you let them in and in the evening, um, you get them out of there and you close it up for the night. Um, it reduced hay intake to about what we were shooting for um, with the idea of that higher quality hay and a mid gestation cow to about 24. So we reduced it about three pounds. The other thing that's really cool with doing this is that it also reduces waste. Um, in this case, they reduce waste by about half um, by limiting them down to 14 hours a day uh, because they just don't spend as much time um, kind of going in and coming out. So they stick to it a little bit more because a lot of the waste happens when they're pulling out of the round bell feeders. And then they could reduce it even more uh, down to 21 pounds if we went to six hours. What's And again, we even got waste reduced even further by doing this. So this can be a really nice combination where I might do this and really limit some hay intake and then start using a supplement to actually meet her needs, especially if I'm short on hay and I can't find hay to buy. Um, so this is one option uh, for people to consider. Now, another one that I wanted to uh, talk about was using alfalfa hay in a very similar manner. So if I think about um, this particular study, they were doing alfalfa hay and they did a very similar thing where they reduced the amount of time that they had access. So they reduced it down to nine, six or three hours a day. And what I did is this was some fairly good alfalfa hay in terms of energy value, um, maybe a little bit lower on the protein side of things but I predicted how much um, TDN and crude protein they would be consuming based off of these intakes. Uh, similar patterns that we saw with the grass hay where we reduced intake by um, reducing the amount of access. I will say that in this study, the amount of alfalfa hay intake wasn't as dramatically decreased um, as we saw with grass hay. So the type of hay does uh, make a difference in terms of how much you're going to reduce it. And so one of the things that's a little bit challenging is there's a combination of the type of hay and the quality um, that impacts the prediction of how much they're going to eat. So if you are doing this, you really do have to watch body condition and just make sure that um, they are maintaining, or you might have to give them a few more hours of access if you start seeing them slipping a little bit. But I did want to show you this idea of even like limiting them down to three hours a day of, um, of alfalfa hay. In this case, you might do that, especially if we're really short on hay, and then combine it with feeding some alternatives. Like we could feed them a concentrate like corn or distillers, and use uh, the alfalfa as a roughage and a protein source um, while using a concentrate to make up the rest of the energy. Or we could use another roughage source like uh, grass hay or corn residue. Um, so I've been getting a lot of questions lately about using corn residue and in particular using corn residue uh, in a round bell feeder because you know a lot of people don't have the ability um, to really process corn residue. And so I did want to talk about that example. But before we go there, I wanted to um, take a step back and talk about, okay, if we had 7.2 pounds of TDN because we were restricting them down to just three hours a day of access to that alfalfa hay, how much um, would we have to feed of corn or distillers to meet our needs? Well, Let's talk about corn first, um, because I think this is this is going to sound scary to some people. But if I was to feed only um, 12 pounds of dry matter of alfalfa, I would need to feed uh, about six uh, pounds of corn in mid gestation to meet our needs. So you'd be feeding quite a bit of corn in late gestation. I have to up that to 10 pounds. 
but there is there's actually been some studies where they have fed um, very high levels of corn like this to gestating cows and have shown uh, it to be just as effective as you know a hay only ration uh, in terms of what we see in terms of you know calving breed up the subsequent breed up and all those things. And then the big difference would be whether or not it's more cost effective, which we can get to in a second. And for some of you, it may or may not be depending on the other feed resources you have and what you can get. Distillers is another option. Um, and I know a lot of people think about distillers as being a protein supplement, which it is, but it's also very high in energy. And in some cases, it's still a cheaper source of energy. Uh, so in this case, if we were talking about distillers, because it is higher in energy, you'd only need about four pounds of distillers in mid-gestation. Um, and then in late gestation, you need about seven pounds of distillers if you were really cranking them down on how much hay they had access to. Uh, okay, so what about costs? Well, one of the important things is when we talk about feeding our cows, we really need to think about how much is it going to cost us to feed those cows. And I put a um, I put a link here to the feed cost calculator, which can help you really look at your options because you need to take into account the nutrient content of the feeds. You need to take into account the waste that you're going to have when you're feeding it, depending on the feeding method, as well as what it's going to cost you to get it there. So transportation. Um, what I did here, which is a lot of numbers, I know, but I just I just went and said, okay. What are some costs that I'm seeing out there on the market right now? And I just took those as fed costs on a per ton basis. By the way, corn, I use $7.10 per bushel, and that equates to $254 um, per ton as fed, just FYI. Um, and then I just took some other options that I saw. I actually just went to... Um, uh, I went to the USDA uh, hay... Um, market and just said, okay, what could I buy right now if I went and made some calls? And so that was kind of some of the numbers that I came up with. And then what I did was I put it on a cost of TDN and a cost of crude protein. And that's the way you really should think about it as how much does it cost me on an energy basis and how much does it cost me on a protein basis? And then the other thing I did for our example today is I assumed that if I was feeding corn or distillers, I'd be feeding it in a bunk. And I assumed that I would be using a uh, sheeted ring. So like that 10% to 15%. So I use 12% waste for uh, our haze. And then I put corn residue on here. And here's the key on corn residue. When we have fed corn residue in a round bell feeder, um, they're going to sort just like they try to sort when they go out and graze. They want the leaf and the husk and they will refuse a lot of the stock, which is about 40% of the bale. On average, between refusals and waste, they won't eat about 45% of the bale. So that's the numbers I put in here. Um, so that's what the difference is between this number and this number is basically that I went and said 45% of it is not gonna be feed. Um, but even with that at $90 a ton, which I thought was ridiculously expensive, by the way, I'm sure you all feel the same way about current um, prices. Um, it still looks pretty good relative to some of the other haze that I could find out there on the market. Uh, so I think that's important to consider when you're thinking about the cost of it. And we can use this as a hay stretcher, which I'll show you in just a second. But right now, it looks like even at $280, um, relative to $7 corn, um, distillers is still a fairly good source of TDN. It's I used 104 for the TDN, uh, the percent TDN. Ooh, I should put that on there. That's percent TDN. And 83 for corn because I assumed a high forage diet. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show you, I think it's really important to consider. And then the other one, just looking at uh, protein basis, distillers still looks pretty good. Um, this is dry distillers, by the way, uh, at, at 280 a ton. Um, we're looking at it being a cheaper source of protein uh, followed by alfalfa. Okay, so we can play with these uh, in the Q&A if you want to and change numbers and see what it looks like. 
Um, so we can do all that in just a second. But I kind of want to get that in your mind because I wanted to get you thinking about the option of um, using potentially corn residue and with alfalfa, for instance, or maybe using corn and distillers um, with uh, uh, hay. Okay, so I wanted to talk about this because this one's been, I've been getting a lot of questions about, and corn residue bales, um, as offered, are fairly low quality, 40 to 45 TDN. Uh, usually we see a little bit lower quality um, with irrigated uh, than dry land, but still very low quality. Um, uh, 40 to 45 TDN, 5 to 6% crude protein. Um, as consumed, um, when they get to sort, as you can see, they were working very hard to sort this. Um, as they sort it out, um, they'll select about a 55 TDN diet and about 4% crude protein. And you might notice they actually select a lower crude protein content. And that's because they like the husk and the husk is very low crude protein. It's usually like 3% crude protein. Um, so they're selecting husk and leaf here. Intake is low. They spend a lot of time working on sorting. Um, so they're only going to eat uh, about 1.2% of body weight for a mid-gestation cow. That's all that we got her to eat in, in our experiments doing this, which is only about 15 pounds of dry matter. Um, so it can be a hay stretcher. Um, we could use it and use a supplement with it, but alone it is not going to meet her needs. So this is kind of what the balance looks like. So I just took, again, here's the needs, uh, mid-pregnancy and late pregnancy um, for a 1,300 pound cow. And then I said, what does corn residue that was baled and fed in a round bell feeder, what is it going to provide? Um, because her intakes are so low, she's only going to eat about 8.3 pounds of TDN and about uh, 0.6 pounds of crude protein. So we have to provide this much supplement some way. We could use distillers as a supplement and feed in mid-gestation four pounds uh, of dried distillers or 5.3 5 during late gestation with that round bell. Um, and by the way, you do need to, you know, um, you got to be careful not to really limit their intakes because they once they select through and there's just stock left, you got to give them new bales. That's another um, hard thing to judge, but it's really important. Or we could use alfalfa as we were talking about before. Maybe you unroll it and you give them like eight pounds of alfalfa plus whatever uh, you got to account for waste based off of the method you're feeding. If you're unrolling, got to add 20%. Um, if you're doing that limit access idea, you might, uh, with a sheeted round bell feeder, you could go down to 10%, right? And then in late gestation, uh, we could be shooting for 11 pounds. So if we looked at that, we'd probably be looking at about, um, you know, somewhere close to nine uh, to uh, 13 pounds that we'd want to be shooting for. And if you went back and kind of looked at the options here for alfalfa, nine to 13 pounds, I mean, we could get fairly close, you know, somewhere in this uh, maybe five or six hours of access a day if you wanted to do it in the round bell feeder. Or again, you could unroll or process and feed that. Okay. So last thing that I wanted to talk about before we open it up uh, for discussion is about hay testing. And one thing I, I say hay testing is really important and it is. And while the lab analysis is pretty doggone accurate, um, it only tells you the sample that you provided to them. And a grab sample is only gonna represent about one square foot in the field. So if you looked across a field and you said, um, does this one square foot represent uh, my entire field? The likelihood that it will is fairly low. So that's why using a hay probe is really, really useful because it goes through multiple layers and you're able to sample multiple bales. So you get a better representation of, of your lot, of your hay lot. Um, couple key things about hay probes. Uh, we do have some that are available through uh, Nebraska Extension. Most local uh, offices have one, uh, but I would encourage you to consider buying one. Uh, and this, actually this link right here 
has a list of places that sell various hay probes. Uh, one key thing is that really we're kind of looking for something that's at least 18 inches for most round bells and um, three eighths of a diameter is three eighths of an inch diameter is probably um, a good diameter to shoot for. I like them when they have canisters um, so that I can take multiple samples at once um, without having to dump it. And I also really do like the smooth um, tips because then I can sharpen them myself. Um, and so I can make sure it remains sharp. You can get uh, ones that have serrated edges. Those are fine, but you should make sure that you buy a couple extra so you always have a sharp one on hand because it, nothing worse than having a dull probe. Not only does it slow things down, but you'll actually start pushing away um, some of the tougher material like the stems and you won't get a very representative sample. Um, what does a reparative sample really mean? Well, 15 to 20 bales is what we suggest from each lot. And a lot of hay is the same field or at least you know fields that are adjacent to each other um, with similar soil types that are cut on the same day and baled on the same day. Especially, you know, if you get a rain, let's say you get half the field baled and then you get a rain and you don't bail the other half, you know, for another few days, make sure you keep those separate. And then similar plant types. So you might even split a field if you have a field that maybe has a lower area and, um, maybe a hill area and you get some differences in either weed pressure or even just predominant grass that might be there, um, you might want to separate those and, and sample them separately and keep track of that. And then lastly, uh, label it with the main species if you can. And I say that because um, especially if you're trying to use NIR analysis, which is the, the cheaper analysis, um, they really need to know which equation to be using. And so you can help them out by telling them the species. Uh, the other thing about NIR, it's great. Um, it's reduced labor for them and that's why it is cheaper. But the key thing is that it only works for sample types that they have uh, typically coming into the lab that they have developed an equation for. So if you have something that's like a mix or just something that's odd, go ahead and pay to get wet chemistry done because they don't really have a good equation for it. Okay, so the things that you really wanna look for um, when you send it in, you wanna make sure you're getting something that tells you the crude protein content and something that gives you an estimate of TDN. I particularly like if it's a summative equation, but um, you're really gonna look at on a dry matter basis, what is the crude protein and what is the TDN? Now, um, the other things you might want to get, and I would suggest, uh, especially given the cost of phosphorus, get a phosphorus analysis as well, um, so you can decide, do I need to be supplementing phosphorus or not? Um, and that's all I got. I will open it up uh, to have what uh, questions, um, to hear what questions you have and see what discussion we can get going. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Uh, feel free to add any questions you might have in the chat or now is also a great time if you'd like to unmute. Uh, feel free to, to ask any questions that you guys might have. Check the chat box. And I just put in the chat a, a link to a cattle, cattle's requirement. It's a um, it's actually an extension publication from Oklahoma. Uh, they are paying me. No, I'm kidding. Um, they're not paying me. Uh, but it's actually really useful because it does have their requirements of the various types of animals. And it'll tell you the pounds of TDN, the pounds of crude protein they require. Um, so I think it's um, quite useful to, to look at. So if you're looking for a resource, it's a great resource. So one of my questions would be, you know, what are you guys thinking about doing? Um, is there something that you're thinking about doing that, that's maybe a little bit different from what you traditionally do and you just want to bounce it off somebody? Um, I'd be happy to give you any, uh, any of my nutritional thoughts. <laughs> um, and we also have uh, Brent and Casey here and they can, they can help us out as well.
Yeah, I'd, I'd just be curious as to maybe what supplement strategies folks are thinking of. Oh, we've got one in the chat here. What's your option on feeding silage as a supplement to bread and lactating cows? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about silage, it's fairly high energy, um, depending uh, if I would, again, get it tested because this year with the uh, with the drought, I've been seeing 60, 65 TDN silage, and I've also been seeing like a 72 TDN, which is kind of a normal number, um, and also fairly high protein, eight to 9%. Um, it can be a great thing uh, in terms of working it into a ration. I will tell you on bread cows, um, one of the challenges with silage is that it's fairly high energy, which means that if you're trying to combine it with hay, again, you're going to want to limit how much hay you're feeding. Um, the other thing I would point out is that, especially with corn silage, that sometimes people forget that it's only 30% dry matter, which means you actually have to feed three times as much, right, to get to the same amount as what you'd be thinking about them eating of hay, the same amount of dry matter. Um, so a lot of times I see people who um, they are thinking they're feeding a lot of silage when they're really not feeding that much. <laughs> um, so in terms of without the nutritional analysis and combination of what else you're going to feed, I will tell you that um, I, I can't give you exact numbers. I will uh, Courtney, you have a question? I am sorry, I do not. I was trying to get everything figured out. My husband was calling me and I actually pressed unmute. Sorry. No worries, not a problem at all. Um, I will tell you on, on uh, lactating cows, uh, when we do, I've done quite a few rations with corn silage and alfalfa hay, uh, because that's usually the question, the two combinations that I get a question on. And we almost always, especially for young cows, have to put in um, just a little bit of distillers to get the right amount of protein, to get actually enough protein in there um, in that early lactation. And it's really important to have some of that bypass protein um, so that they breed up well. So that's just a, a, a little note there that uh, it's really good to work with a nutritionist and make sure, especially on those young cows that we're meeting those needs so that we don't have a breed up problem. Um, got another question. I have rye hay and it has a seed head, but I don't know if it has grain in it. Yeah. So one thing about rye um, is that the head has what we call an on, which is like a little spike. Um, and it can uh, cause uh, sore mouths. So it can get stuck like in their cheek and it can cause an abscess. Uh, so especially if it has a seed head and it is, um, and it is hay, we actually don't really like to do that, but really would suggest you actually getting it ground, <laughs> um, because otherwise you can have a problem, um, with getting some sore mouths and you can have some cows kind of go downhill because she has a sore mouth. Um, so, and it's also not very palatable because of those ons. So it's, um, it would be my suggestion to think about, uh, hopefully you have the ability to feed that hay and ground and mixed into something. Um, you could try doing something to soften it some, like that's actually one of the reasons why we suggest making silage out of it is that those ons will be soft and so they won't stick into their mouths very much. Um, if it does have grain in it, uh, it can increase the feeding value uh, because it is that starch is available. If you do send it off, they will, um, when they analyze it, they can pick that up. So they can, they can do that for you. Um, so I would say I get it tested. Uh, another question, we're using steep liquor that's 18% crude protein and 8% fat and uh, soaking our hay bales with it uh, about 15 gallons. It gets them to eat more of the coarse hay better. Yes, so there's definitely um, some advantage uh, with low quality forages like corn residue 
or you know cane hay for instance um to maybe even some reeds this year uh <laughs> to putting some uh, steep liquor on it because it makes it more palatable. It also does add a little bit of nutrients to it. Um, but one of the things to, to understand is that, again, you're not really adding a whole lot of nutrients uh, because a lot of times, you know, that's a lot of water. Um, so it does help uh, with the palatability factor. Um, and so that's great. But um, just make sure that you actually are working with somebody to think through, am I getting enough nutrients into them? Okay, recommendations on protein supplementation for uh, developing fall weaned heifers on corn stalks uh, for replacements. Okay, so one of the questions would be, you know, what are you shooting for? A pound to a pound and a half of gain? Um, if you're looking for a pound and a half, if they're grazing on corn stalks, I'm assuming grazing, you can tell me if I'm wrong. If they're grazing on corn stalks, uh, we typically say that you're really shooting for about a half a percent of body weight of distillers. Um, so let's say there's six weights just, uh, for easy math. Somebody unmute. If if they're if they're six hundred pounds, that'd be about three pounds. I did it on dry matter basis, so that'd be a dry distillers. You'd be looking at a, a little over three pounds is probably what you need for a six hundred pound heifer um, to get about a, a pound and a half. Uh, I will tell you that we see two things. One is that grazing on corn stalks. Um, depending on the year, right, if you have, if it's really cold or if it's wet, actually wet is worse than cold. Um, we'll see the performance go down a little bit and you might have to feed a little bit more. Um, the other thing is to make sure that they aren't trampling in all of the forage. Like you might set them out there, use the grazing corn stalk calculator and say, oh, I've got this many days. Uh, but if you get a little bit of a wet spell, which we can only hope for, um, if you get a little bit of a wet spell, you might have to uh, pull them and move them earlier than what you would think. Um, so I usually like to go out and just look for husk. If it's hard to find husk, it's time to move them. Um, but about three pounds should be sufficient to get where you're looking for. If you want to go up a little bit more to make sure you hit your, your target, then that'd be okay too. Sarah has, I have some dry land soybean stubble I'm concerned about using because of the dust and pneumonia potential. Any recommendations on how to proceed? So you're wanting to feed uh, soybean stubble? Um, <laughs> if that's the case, uh, I will tell you that soybean stubble is, I, I liken it to sawdust. Um, and there's not much, much feeding value there. Because it's like, uh, I think I saw it's about three and a half percent crude protein and about 35 TDN. Um, ah, so she's she saying plan, she, they plan on grazing on the picked field. Yeah, it's uh, again, I mean, there might, might be some pods that they can eat, but there's not a lot of feed value out there. You will see them go out and try to like select uh, pods. Um, but I usually don't think about it as uh, really much of a feed resource because the amount of time they have to spend to get much feed is fairly low. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, if it's, I know a lot of people will, you know, fence in the soybeans with uh, the corn stalks. That's fine. And you're right, probably this year with the dust, it may not be ideal. <laughs> but it's not a real great feed resource, just to be honest. Any way you use it, I like to just keep it out in the field. If you got a wide variation in hay quality, what strategy should you use to go through that inventory? Feed the bed first, save the good later, rotate. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question, Charles. So I think um, I think there's a couple things to think about. Uh, one is thinking about yeah, later, like right now, they're kind of the lowest requirements for your mature cows, and then they increase as you get closer to calving. So one option would be to think about using the low qual lower quality stuff now. 
But honestly, one of the things that's really helpful is to, to see what you have and then also think about well, what can meet needs when, because sometimes you might find that, well, my maybe my medium or higher quality hay will actually fit my needs now without any additional supplement. And then um, I'm going to have to supplement the other time, uh, like later in the season anyways. So I might as well like switch it up and just have to feed a little bit more supplement later, but I cut them out of time that I have to supplement. So there's no one right answer. Um, I'll oftentimes when I look at at uh, somebody's hay resources, I kind of go through various scenarios and it depends on, you know, where the cows are going to be at various times, um, what's easier in terms of how to feed the hay and whether or not feeding supplement is feasible at that time. Um, so I don't really like the idea of um, alternating, although you could, like if it's a little bit lower quality and you need just a little bit more that maybe every other day you're going, that might work. Um, so I don't know that there's a right answer to be honest, um, but I would think about uh, strategies to help uh, reduce, you know, the amount of time that you have to spend actually going out and supplementing. Um, so I do kind of sometimes actually do the reverse of what you might think, which is I might feed, you know, my hay that's a little bit better earlier just because then I don't have to supplement. All depends on hay quality and whether it's going to meet your needs. And by the way, we're here to help. So if you have, you know, your hay resources, um, if you can tell us how much hay you have of each type, you can give us the feed analysis and tell us what the animals are that you have. We can come up with some um, various options and think about the puzzle pieces and all the, the groups that you might have. So um, that's actually one of my favorite parts of my job is, is putting puzzles together. <laughs>